Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining today's webinar uh, as part of Made in NYC Week 2020 uh, Business. Hey everyone, Can thanks so much for joining today's webinar uh, okay. as Week 2020 uh, Business. Hey everyone. Hey everyone, some technical difficulties. Sorry, there was some overlap in the background. Uh, we're we're good. We got it going now. Um, so I'll start again. This is I'm Joanna Reynolds, the manager of programs and partnerships for Made in NYC. And this webinar is about business uh, futures and worker ownership conversions. Um, we're really excited to have this conversation as part of Made in NYC Week. Made in NYC Week 2020 is an annual celebration of New York City's manufacturing community. Uh, this year, we're touching on the themes of recovery, resilience, and racial equity. Uh, today's theme is around making equitable futures, uh, and worker ownership conversions is one way uh, to do that for our manufacturing and maker businesses in New York City. Um, before I get started and I introduce our great lineup of speakers today, I'm going to quickly thank Made in NYC Week's sponsors. So just want to give a really big thank you to the New York City Council, who supports Made in NYC's work all year round, as well as a big thank you to Square, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Uncommon Goods, Goldman Sachs, Cozen O'Connor, uh, GMDC, Lisk NYC, TD Bank, Verizon, City Point, and Adafruit. Um, we additionally, uh, as uh, along with all of the virtual events that we're running all year, all week long, we have a um, exclusive online marketplace with Uncommon Goods, where you can shop local Main NYC products um, for the entire month of October. So, with that, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have uh, representatives from uh, the Business Outreach Network, BACnet. Um, we have representatives from the Working World and the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. I'll have them introduce themselves. So thank you so much for joining and we'll, we'll take it from here. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Joanna, for that introduction. Um, I see you're all popping in the screen. That's cool. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, my name is Mikhail Laskognic. I am business services manager at SBIDC, Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. Um, we're a local nonprofit that supports um, industrial manufacturing businesses in Red Hook, Gowanus, and Sunset Park. And we're proud to be part of this um, initiative, um, the Equitable Industrial uh, Development Initiative. Um, that is, we will get into this in a second, but it is a project that is um, supported by the city, by the um, minority and women-owned business enterprise, by the mayor's office, as well as city foundation. Um, so as Joanna mentioned today, we have in the room, um, Alice Maggio and Michelle Sanz, uh, both from the working world, um, who will assist us in answering questions about what exactly are uh, worker ownership conversions. Um, we have Brenda Martin, executive director with the working world as well, um, and my colleagues, um, Quincy L. Kate from uh, Bok Network and Ryan Cagle with Bok Network as well. Um, so I will just um, I wanted to outline what we will be discussing today. Um, uh, Quincy will start us off providing a context for, for the program and why it's relevant today. Um, then we will provide a brief presentation about what exactly some, some basic definitions and also um, what the process is about. If you're interested, if you're a business owner and you're interested in hearing more, how can you be part of the program? Um, and then we will give some time for questions and answers towards the end. Um, so without further ado, Quincy, can you please let us know why conversions are important right now? All right. Thank you, Micaela. Um, thank you, Joanna and the team from Made in NYC. Uh, this is a really um, important uh, worker co cooperative conversions are something that um, 
you know, we feel really strongly about and, and think it's uh, very pertinent to the um, current landscape of economic development and, and small business development in, uh, around the nation, but definitely in New York City in the industrial sector. Um, my name is Quincy. I work for the Business Outreach Center. I'm the director of our industrial business program. So we work with small businesses, industrial businesses, manufacturers, uh, in, primarily in Brooklyn and Queens. But you know what? One thing that we were seeing um, and have been seeing prior to COVID was uh, something called the silver tsunami, which is basically um, you know a generation of business owners um, that are aging and you know looking to exit their business. And so what is that's been referred to kind of this boom of uh, of uh, baby boomers leaving their businesses has been referred to as the silver tsunami. So really a lot of business owners who are looking to transition their business, um, potentially sell their business, um, pass it on to the next generation. Um, this has really been um, sped up with COVID. Um, as you can all imagine, um, and I'm sure you've seen many business owners who were thinking of, of retiring uh, previously, you know, now might be facing, uh, you know, being evicted or some type of bankruptcy, um, or really just looking to exit their business. Now, um, they don't want to be part of ramping it up for the next, uh, five years, uh, which might take to get back to the pre COVID levels. So what the biz, what we're working on the initiative, um, is really, to provide an opportunity for business owners to 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 sell their business, transition their business um, in a way where they can recoup some of the um, the value that they have invested in the business over their many years, um, and 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 sell it to to their employees. Um, so we're you know focused on the industrial sector for this initiative. Um, we see the industrial sector as a, you know, as a as a stable um, type of business. A lot of these are legacy manufacturers have been around for many years, um, provide quality jobs, um, stable jobs for for their employees. Um, and you know, we want to see, and the city wants to see those businesses remain in in New York City and and continue uh, providing quality employment um, for its employees. So this initiative is is really on identifying businesses that are are you know have an owner that's looking to potentially sell his business, transition his or her business, um, um, might not have the same type of buyers lining up that you know they had previously, um, and you know we want to provide uh, an opportunity for financing and technical assistance so that business owner could. Uh, sell the business to their workers, um, and then continue their legacy, um, and also, you know, ensure that there's security for their workers uh, going forward. So we we see it as a really viable solution, um, and and something that will hopefully be part of the this important recovery that we are we're going to be working on. So uh, that was my kind of introduction to the program a little bit, a little bit of the framing of why we're uh, pursuing this this initiative. Um, and I would like to pass it back on. I'm looking forward to questions. I'll pass it back on to Micaela. Thank you, Quincy. That was great. Can you guys see my screen, the presentation? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> I don't see cameras right now. Um, Okay, so um, would the working world want to add anything to that, that framing of the, the problem that we have here on the screen? Um, we had some statistics. Uh, on average, 80% of a business owner's wealth is tied up to um, their business. But then in the business community, 90% of business owners are planning on garnering some liquidity from their businesses to fund retirement, although 70 or to 80% of the businesses put, that put on the market do not sell. So that's why um, this initiative is so interesting and important in this moment, as Quincy was saying before. 
So, um, and any of my organizations here, please let me know if you want to interject at any point of this uh, brief presentation, just so everyone in the room understands what are we talking about, um, some basic concepts. What are conversions? What is this um, service that we're providing to business owners right now? And why should I consider transitioning my business to worker ownership? Um, so conversions are the transition of a company from a sole or family ownership business to employee ownership, by which the employees now have governance of money and decision-making power as well. And then employee ownership itself here, we just wanted to make a clear distinction. Um, on the right side, you guys can see what how worker-owned cooperatives are structured um, in terms that it is worker-owned cooperatives are owned, controlled, and um, the benefits of the enterprise go all to worker owners. Um, in clear contracts, contrast to a conventional business where um, the ownership and the control and who benefits from the success goes to investors and shareholders. Um, so it's it's a thing about ownership, but it's also it's the the decision making uh, structure in the business uh, changes completely. Um, and here we have also some information about ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans. Um, we can get into that in the questions because there's always um, a little bit of about confusion um, whether what we're promoting in this program is an ESOP. Uh, but no, they're, they're very different, and uh, we can get in, into that in, in the question section if there's any doubt about it. Miguel, yes, real quick, it um, seems like we can't quite see the slides. Um, mm -hmm. Joanna, do you have access to, to help out there? Can you guys not see the slides? No. We could not, but you did a very good job narrating them. I felt like I could. Definitely. Thank you, guys. We can see them now. Now we can see them. Yeah. No? Okay. Well, we can. What is employee ownership? It's not full screen, but if you full screen it, it'll be Right. Perfect. Okay. Let me know if I full screen it. Okay. If you guys can still see them. See? Ah, see, that's when it disappears. <laughs> okay. So we'll, oh, we'll just leave it. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Um, no worries. Okay. So I'll just. Yeah. Can still see? Sure. Perfect. That looks good. That's yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. Um, okay, so as I mentioned before, and these are these are materials that we can circulate with the attendees to this event. Um, there's a difference between employee stock ownership plans, ESOPs, and worker cooperatives. Uh, we won't get into this in detail right now, but just for you to know that what we're promoting here is worker-owned cooperatives. That's the conversion service that we can provide. Um, so cooperatives can use many different forms, many different legal forms. Um, a cooperative can be an LLC, it can be a corporation, it can be a nonprofit as well. Um, and then Again, we're basically touching upon some of like the basic definitions and we will get into the program in a second. Um, what are the advantages of conversion? Why should I consider selling uh, my business to my employees instead of another buyer? Um, and here the benefits are twofold. There's advantages to the business owner and there's advantages to the employees. For the business owner, um, you can capitalize on the value that you have invested and created for the business through the years. Um, with this program that we're promoting, you can avoid the standard 15% 15, 15 business broker fee. Um, there's, there's no fees in this program, thanks to um, the, the partnership that um, the mayor's office uh, and the city foundation has provided to, to train some of our um, service providers in, in learning how to do conversions. Um, then there's tax benefits available for worker-owned businesses. Um, and finally, you can preserve the legacy of your business and the jobs you've created and, and not be in this issue of not being available, able to find um, a buyer, which is very common. And then there's advantages to the employees um, who can build wealth through equity in the company and potentially increase their income 
Um, we've heard in many cases that um, they are tired uh, about innovating and thinking of new ways of selling the products. And, and it seems that in many cases, it's the employees who have um, more interest and, and you know, the energy to take the business to the next level. So this is one of the advantages of conversions. It's, it's capitalizing on that, on that energy and interest of the employees in, in making uh, advancing the business. Also, of course, you increase job security and resiliency, especially during economic downturns. Um, the solution or, or the alternative of um, worker-owned cooperatives is um, is a model that that has been uh, spe specifically with the working world, and and they can tell you more about this. Um, their their work with conversions began in Argentina during the crisis and the 2000s, um, when many um, factories were uh, experiencing a lot of economic problems. Um, so it's exactly in these moments of crisis, like, just like with COVID, uh, in which this kind of innovative um, ownership models can thrive. Um, Brendan, would you like to add anything to that? Um, if I, yeah. You know, there's so many reasons to sell uh, to your employees. I think most owners, would, their probably question is, is this going to work? And I'll say, you know, I was in Argentina when there was a crisis that's similar to the one we have now. And uh, we watched hundreds of businesses not close because instead the employees started running them. So, um, you know, what Quincy said about how this is a way, it's a real practical, functional way. It's not magical at all, but it's a real practical, functional way for owners to not have to close their business. I mean, if they're real, if they're exhausted at the prospect of rebuilding after COVID, bringing the workers on board, maybe getting, you know, getting some of their value back out of that company through a buyout for those workers is, a, is and with these benefits, Michaela, you're just outlining of how there's no broker's fee. You can even save on capital gains taxes. Um, there's a lot of reasons why, why owners would want to do it. And for employees, I think the one thing I'd put there, number one, um, is you keep your job. So that's probably what matters to a lot of employees as the top thing is they worry about their company closing and all the rest of it is just, is gravy. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thanks, Brandon. Um, okay, so just to outline two more advantages. Um, Employee-owned cooperatives can have a bigger chance at improving business productivity through shared problem solving and increased buy-in. And finally, um, there's increased control and voice in the operations of the business, and this this speaks to you know a, a, a larger or or more democratic practices in the workplace, thanks to this um, different kind of uh, business ownership. So, having established some of those definitions, uh, we wanted to tell you a little bit more about, about this program um, that we're introducing today. Uh, the Work to Worth program. Um, so here's a little bit more info of information about how it works. Uh, so there's three different uh, large phases. There's the initial assessment uh, that goes from one to two weeks uh, in which we conduct an assessment of the business uh, to we look at their financials and socioeconomic impact of the business. And so here there's there's an aspect that speaks to the legibility um, so, for example, if any, if any of the businesses that are attending today in this um, event had, were to consider that this could be a viable option for, to preserve their legacy and, you know, to increase um, democratic ownership in the business, uh, we, we would get in touch with them. Uh, we would look at their financials in a, on a very like, big picture um, scale and also, um, the, the companies that make the best candidates for us are those that are profitable, and we will get into this in a second. Um, but it can be, we are looking at profitability pre-COVID, because of course we understand things have changed a lot since March. Um, and then also in which we look at whether you have a minority um, and women um, employees because we're looking to make conversions that have a, can have a meaningful impact on the lives on the employees and the community. 
So those are some of the elements that we take into consideration. Then there's a period of diligence that lasts around two months in which we conduct financial, operational, legal due diligence um, with the owner's assistance. Um, you know, the idea is that the owner can remain on board during all this phase in which we are assessing the business. Um, the idea is that this assessment can inform the transition plan um, and, you know, to understand properly uh, which, how employees will be trained to acquire managerial skills, um, among other processes. And then there's the process of sale and follow through, which lasts approximately a month. Um, if the due diligence is successful, um, the company sale is finalized and the first payment is made right away to the seller. Um, from this point, training and employee engagement begins um, and ownership is transferred. So there's many, many of these different elements can be um, um, tweaked and customized to the specific case of the business, but this is the standard procedure, let's say. Who can support me in converting to employee ownership? Here, um, there's many different resources. There's financial guides put together by the working world um, in order to, you know, they, they will help with assembling financing, solidifying the terms of the owner payback, and finalizing the sale of the business. Then there's the technical assistant partners. Um, Quincy, Ryan here also, um, myself, we all represent organizations that, that have experience in supporting small businesses. And our day-to-day -day job is actually is assisting businesses with business education and financing assistance and recruitment and training support. So this, this program is just one another one of those suite of services that we provide on a day-to-day -day basis. So we can we are getting trained right now by the working world in this process of conversion so that we can learn um, to, to do those conversions ourselves so we can assist them, assist you with the conversion itself, but even with other um, services. And finally, the city, um, please be reminded that this is a program that is supported by the New York City's Mayor's Office of Minority and Women-Owned Businesses, um, and they are the ones that are um, sponsoring this initial free consultation and technical assistance and a pathway to a private lender um, for eligible businesses. So how to know if you're eligible for this program? Um, you're eligible if you own a small business, if your business was profitable before the COVID-19 pandemic. So as I mentioned, we were looking for profitable businesses so that once the conversion is made, um, profitability can continue and, and be trespassed to the employees, uh, transferred to the employees, sorry. Um, but now what we're looking at is profitability before the pandemic hit. Um, we're looking at businesses that have a size of at least three workers and your business must be located in one of the five boroughs of New York City. So um, how does the owner get paid back once they're, they, we find an eligible uh, business or the business approach us and we see in this initial assessment, okay, we could work together. How does the owner get paid back? So the standard deal structure is that um, if eligibility is met, the working world can finance the purchase of the company on behalf of the workers. Um, so the working world being a community-based lender, basically. Um, the owner will receive a 50% down payment at the moment that the deal is struck. And then the owner will be repaid out of annual profits over time. That's the period of transition that coincides with the period of transition um, being, you know, a gradual process. And just for you to understand um, how this works, this is a, um, a little like graphic illustration. Um, so we have a traditional um, business that's all owned by a sole owner. And then in the, in the pyramid of decision making and ownership, we have the employees at the base. Um, there's a conversation between the owner and the working world um, and there's potential there's a potential deal here so the former owner would receive a 50 percent down payment 50 percent of 
um, we we ask questions to the owner about what is the asking price, and then um, there's negotiation based on financials uh, and our um, documentation. Um, so the idea is that there is a profit for the employees once the uh, business is sold to the employees. So the owner will receive a 50% down payment of the price agreed for the business. And then there is a transfer of ownership from former owner to the employees. So we have that the former owner, now the ownership structure um, is transformed into several worker owners instead of uh, one former owner. And then from the annual profits, this is how it works. Um, the owner gets paid a percentage of profits that is the inverse of the down payment. So the, after the, the, this 50% down payment, uh, we have of the annual profits, the former owner would receive 50% um, of, of the price. And then a 30% will go towards the working world so that they can get repaid this loan that they provided to the workers. And then the remaining 20% goes to the worker owners um, as, the, as a form of profit. So that's, in a nutshell, the, the way the deal structure works. Um, I would like to, to give the floor to my colleagues, um, Michelle Sanz and Alice Maggio, um, both senior project officers with the working world, so they can tell us a little bit more about um, businesses in New York City that have been um, converted um, via the working world. Thanks, Michaela. So we just wanted to give you two examples of what some companies that have converted can look like, just to give you an idea that these can range in all different kinds of businesses and different sizes. Um, and so one of the companies that the working world has helped to convert is JKS Printing, which is out in the Rockaways. And it's a small company. It was a, it's a mom and pop shop on a main street in the Rockaways. And uh, the owners were looking to retire. And we were able to help uh, convert to worker ownership. So the three employees were able to take over ownership through um, the kind of financing that Michaela just explained. Um, we made a down payment in 2017, and then the repayment of the, the rest of the value uh, happened over a two and a half year period. And now the former owners have been repaid, back, repaid fully. Um, and so this is an example of one of those main street shops that might be going away if the owners just retire and close up shop. But we see worker ownership as a way to keep those businesses going into the next generation. And I'll let it, uh, Michelle take over for the next one. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Alice. Um, we also have Brooklyn Stone and Tile as an example. They're a stone fabricator and tile installer at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, they moved from their original location in East New York to the city-owned property. Um, they're a $1 million business and growing. Um, it's operated by 12 employees of color who have decades of experience in the industry and they're all on their way to becoming owners. Um, and we're also supporting them as they become an MWBE certified business um, so that they can access city contracts. Um, the quick story about Fantastic. Brooklyn Stone Thank and Thank you, Tile. Michelle. So, yeah, th those are just two examples of the many other businesses that the working world has worked with in, in facilitating this conversion. Um, I just wanted to to end the, this this part of the event, the presentation, with just leaving our information um, for you guys. We will share these materials, of course. Um, but yeah, I want just to open the floor for for questions um, from attendees. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm gonna pop in real quick and um, 
just want to know if there are any uh, like frequently asked questions that you hear a lot that you didn't cover uh, in the presentation that that our viewers might be a little shy around asking. And we know we I know we have people popping in and out throughout the stream. Um, yeah, yeah, just around uh, size of business or if there's anything um, that you think. So I see see one come in um, that said. In the case that I need to sell my business, what is the best way to know my market value? So why don't we start there and see if that helps? Thanks, Joanna. Well, um, yeah, go for it, Mikael. No, go, go, go. <laughs> I was gonna be, uh, refer to yeah. um, perhaps our, our friends at the working world, um, but go ahead, Quincy. Sure, and they can fill in. Um, mm -hmm. I, that's a great question. Um, you know, the, the market value of your business, I think is really gonna depend, it's gonna be industry specific. Um, and then it will obviously be, usually an industry will um, determine kind of a set multiple of, when we talk about a multiple, it's basically your your profitability uh, and you, you take a multiple of what your yearly profitability is uh, and that will determine your market value. And that and that uh, multiple is, is usually determined um by 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 industry um so th that's kind of one way kind of uh this very simplistic way of looking at what the market value is for your business but um i think that the bottom line is understanding your your numbers how profitable the business will be uh will be critical in kind of determining what uh you might be able to receive in terms of a, a buyout for your business um Alice, Brennan, do you, do you have anything you want to add to that? I think that was great. I mean, the hardest thing you want to know if you're what you're worth, you kind of have to figure out how much money you're bringing in. That's usually the biggest bear when we meet an owner. And we say, how much there? We say, well, how much are you make? And they say, well, it depends on how you add it up. We know how complicated, especially small businesses, can get and how personal finances get mixed in with business finances. One of the most important steps is figuring out if you have clean books and clean P&Ls from the past years and do whatever you can to separate your personal finances and really get a sense of what is going to be the free cash flow. Um, and remember, if you do a lot of work, you can't just assume you're going to have to be replaced. So anyone who buys you out is going to have to need your salary is going to still have to be necessary to replace your work. But any profit you were making, um, any expenses that were being covered, any above market salary you were getting, things like that. Or if you were not working full time, you know, then but yet got a full time salary. All that could go into your that that pool of um, of of free cash flow, and also the um, the multiple. It, it'll depend a little bit on how large you are. For smaller companies, they often just get a fixed multiple somewhere between uh, usually around four, three to four. Um, if you're larger, then industry multiples might start to kick in, uh, which could be quite different. But usually, you have to have enough maybe big enough company for the industry multiple to maybe take over. Thanks so much. I did see um, a question just come into the chat in the comments. Um, so I'll read it out to everyone. It says, have you found that the conversion process varies by industry or that there is potential benefit to clustering conversions within a sector? Clustering us in converting uh, many different businesses at the same time. I think this is something that I've um, that I've been discussing lately uh, with some partners. Um, I'm not sure for you guys with the working world if you have experience in this, but it seems that um, this is a model that that might, especially now with, during the pandemic, with this. Um, growing need or for this kind of alternatives, um, it seems that there, there could be, um, this, this process could emerge as, as some form of practice. I don't know if it's something, I haven't seen it yet, but, but uh, apparently it's something that can, that can take shape as a model. We have some experience in it and our making plans to possibly take it to the next level given the scale of issues with the pandemic and the possibility of having a lot more businesses maybe in the same sector or with other overlaps that could be fruitful um, that would be the same time often the timing isn't necessarily right in the past but given the number of businesses that have the same 
time scale, COVID began at the same time for all of us. Um, it's much more possible now. So we're looking into it uh, as really trying to lean into it. Um, and quickly have, hopping back to the first question around is the conversion process, how does it vary by industry or is there really a standard process for all industries? I can take that. Um, so we are focusing in with this initiative, we're focusing mostly on industrial and manufacturing uh, businesses. So we have an industry focus. Um, and what we've studied though, in, in getting trained to, to, for ourselves as, as service providers to do conversions, um, we, there, there are parts in the process in which they're pretty standard um, and, and that apply all through the board. Um, but I imagine that there are specific um, elements that apply to, to some specific industries. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Um, I saw one more question come in. It says, uh, this year sales has been impacted, has sales have, have been impacted many by many businesses. How will this impact the business valuation? So it's been a really tough year for folks. How does that impact people? It's complicated. Um, you know, there's the reality, no one can pay you for, um, if it's, you know, unfortunately, if, if, if your business is both hurt a lot by COVID and, and recovery is going to be challenging, no one can just pay you for what it used to be worth. It's like saying, but my car was worth so much more before that tree fell on it. Um, unfortunately, the tree fell on it and no one's going to pay you for what it used to be worth. That said, you're probably going to have more of an opportunity to try to think about how you can build the business back up and get value out of it by working with this team. Um, cause our goal is not to just get things as cheaply as possible to have them as strong as possible for the workers. And we're not going to do that just by buying businesses that are in trouble. So you're, who's going to have the best chance, the best sense of how a business can grow back out of this current owners and the workers, hopefully. So this is a partnership. Um, and as the way Mikhail explained it, you're going to get a lot of your payout by future profits. And if you said, man, it's going to take a year or two for profits to come back, but then they will come back and it'll be, and it'll be building off of this 20 years of business that I built that's great. You can get a chance to get some of that uh, some of that value out of the future profit it'll get when the business does recover. So if you meet with Alice and Michelle and Michaela and Quincy and Ryan um, and all the rest on the team and, you, and with your workers as well, plan, here's how we can regrow. Um, and, it, and that's successful. You'll have a chance to get some of that value. So it doesn't, you might have trouble getting just a big chunk of cash. Um, you can get some of it, but it might not be as big as it would have been before March 16th. Um, but you still can get, you have a much better chance of getting some of that future earnings that might be um, having to climb that hill by, your, by yourself to that future earnings alone might be a much bigger task than you want to take on and bringing us on and maybe your workers could be the best way to do it. Great, thanks. Um, I saw one more question come into the chat uh, and it is, what are usually the biggest challenges for workers transitioning to worker owner roles? Hmm. Um, there's going to be a lot of training involved uh, in some cases uh, for worker owners having to acquire new skills um, that perhaps they didn't have before. So there might be some challenges around that, but there might also not be as, as many challenges. There are some um, workers that are, are eager in, into taking uh, more responsibility. Um, and then I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I can help answer. Yeah, I, yeah, I think with the yeah. skills, with the skills, I think it's like the, the, the most um, complicated thing or in, in cases that um, what if the workers don't want to transition? That, that might be a challenge as well. Go, yeah, Michelle. Absolutely, yeah, you, you, you nailed it all. Um, it's definitely 
it's it's a rich rich question with a lot of answers and and something that um, relates to the how we convert when we do convert a business is that we work with the owner to come up with a transition plan, identify some strengths in the existing staff, um, and uh, try to figure out how this transition will happen. Um, so the owner plays some role in, in helping us with that, but that's something that we will go in and 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 take take on. Um, with all the complexities that it brings on. In terms of experience doing that, I think um, Brendan might be best placed here to, to share some of those experiences. Um, but, but yeah, you, you said it all, Michaela. The experience, of the, the experience of the training? Yeah, and transitioning. Um, I mean, it's, it's not that it's simple. No one pretends that you can just learn how to do this overnight, but we've discovered that everyone can do it. Um, and the most functional business is the one where the most number of the people who work there understand how the business works. There's a process called open book management that was developed by a company that got worker owned in Missouri. Springfield, Missouri was a manufacturing company, remanufactured engines. Um, and they even developed this process so that everyone in their job would know what ways that their jobs affect the finance. Like when they saved on like not wasting this part or they managed to reach this number of parts per hour or whatever it was. Um, and it, brought the company to life and they became far more profitable than they used to be. And in fact, the value that of that company since the 1980s rose faster than the value of Berkshire Hathaway or Google, um, that work run company. And that's, that's an example of a, that's a shining example of what happens when you can really not be afraid of workers understanding how the business works, but actually figuring out ways to, um, lean into that and really, uh, really nurture that. Doesn't mean that every worker there knows everything that you had to know as an owner. As you know, as an owner, you have to know everything from how the plumbing works to how the finances work, et cetera. One of the great parts about being worker owned is it's not on, it's not one person's job alone anymore. And people can know the overall picture. It's really important they can read the finances generally and then know how their job can influence that financial picture. Um, so it can be a lot to learn, but it's very, very possible and it makes everyone else's jobs easier. Um, so it both takes capacity, but it gives capacity too. It's a worthwhile investment. Um, I, I would just like one other thing I would like to add that, you know, when I'm working and I've met with a lot of business owners, one question that comes up is, you know, my workers don't have the financial capacity to do this uh, or what kind of risk would be associated to them uh, if, if they're going to become owners. Um, and so I think that's one of the big pluses um, of this program is that, you know, workers will become worker owners, but they're not actually, you know, having to, to purchase the business themselves. They're not personally guaranteeing a loan. Um, so it really is creating a pathway for them to ownership that they might not be able to find uh, on their own. And it's, it overcomes a large, uh, significant challenge that, um, that workers, you know, might never have that opportunity. So. Great, thank you. Um, so I know there were a couple of other questions that we had, so maybe we can walk through some of those. Um, one question that uh, I think a lot of people are interested in is um, how long do does someone have to stay with the business after the sale and is there a fee involved in the conversion and, and kind of like how does, how does that work and how mm -hmm. long does that take? I'll take that. There's so there's no uh, fee involved in in the transaction of the business, um, which is you know another upside to this. Usually there's a standard broker fee if you're going to to list and sell your business on the open market. Um, in addition, you know we're also preparing uh, that transition process. So you know documenting how the business is run, uh, creating a transition plan so that it can be uh can be you know run by the workers which otherwise if you were going to sell your business you would you know probably have to come up and, and just by yourself put that all together but we will be part of that process um and i, I believe there was another question within baked in there that i'm, I'm not addressing so if somebody that's else wants year, to sorry that's, that's that? a year it's a two-year transition yeah. right well, um, i think I don't, I don't know if there's a certain, I think it depends. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. You know, it, 
two years would probably be great. Um, but if, you know, a, a business owner wants to leave earlier and uh, wants to spend a lot more time up front trying to work on that transition plan, and it, it's pretty clear that the workers can take it over, then, you know, that would be, it doesn't have to be two years. But, you know, I think there's flexibility. I, you know, we find a lot of, a lot of business owners say, you know what, I'm, I want to retire, but, you know, I still want to kind of be a part of this for the next two years, um, you know, and so there's, there's an opportunity to build that into the plan um, as they, as they slowly transition out. Um, so, you know, and even, you know, there might be, if they're going to be supporting the business, there could be, you know, roles kind of a, a small consulting fee that they can, can still get, but, um, you know, they can, it, there's a lot of flexibility there on how that can work. Yeah, I, I just to add to that, um, what what we do look for though is that, that the owner can be available uh, on call so that they can answer some of the questions that we have to ensure the transition being smooth. And, and something that I'm seeing a lot across the board from businesses that we've discussed that have an interest is that um, in many cases, they just they don't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day, um, responsibilities of the business. They just want to be involved in a, in a different uh, quality that they have before. And, and for them, this, this kind of program is actually very good as well. Um, because you can remain as little or, you know, you can remain as involved as, as you would like. And in some cases, some employees continue, some owners continue as employee owners. Thanks so much. Um, one other question that I know a lot of our companies have or that they really want to go this route, but they don't necessarily feel that their employees are maybe ready or the right fit, but they want they want to figure out how to make it work. Um, but maybe they don't feel like they're they're able to assume some of the responsibilities with ownership and decision making. Um, are there is there advice that you have for businesses that are in that type of situation? We are, um, yeah, we are developing, and even for some businesses that are not entirely, that are not eligible um, for whichever reason that may be, um, we, are, we are looking at ways into, uh, of how to develop um, a, a model uh, that can suit um, increasing democratic practices in those businesses and, and perhaps a beginning transition um, slowly, maybe it's something that's not going to happen right now, uh, but that may happen uh, happen down the road. Um, so there are um, some like in intermediate um, versions uh, in some way of conversion that that I think are going to come out of this program. So I don't know. My, my suggestion would be to a business that's like now we're not ready right now. Um, just to talk to us anyways because there's the, even if it's not conversion what what you have to do right now maybe there's other things that you need to take care of at this moment still you can plan ahead either for conversion or for just you know building in more democratic practices in the workplace so i i would also just build on that i mean if you have uh if you're thinking considering trying to sell your business um in the next couple of years you, let's have a conversation and see where it goes i think if anything i think it could be a valuable exercise in understanding what kind of documents would be need to do like a, an evaluation um and then you know we can go from there uh, but I, I recommend reaching out and it's a it's a free evaluation um and a free assessment so mm -hmm. And apologies if you guys mentioned this earlier, but um, remind us, is there a minimum number of employees that someone has to have in order to go through this process? Yeah, the three. Three is the, the minimum <laughs> that we had established as part of the program. Um, I think, yeah, there's, yeah. there's a, a couple more considerations to that. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are looking at the demographics of the employees as well. Um, you know, we're trying to increase um, employee ownership among communities, um, you know, communities of color, um, uh, women employees as well. Um, 
but I think that regardless of that, we, yeah, we can and have so, a conversation with anyone. Definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, three is probably like the near the bottom, but, you know, we've had conversations with businesses that, you know, close to 200 employees. Um, so it really runs the gamut of di different size businesses. Uh, um, so, yeah. I think we're looking to make impact though, and, and you will see that more in a larger business. Thank you, That that's really helpful. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if there are any other questions coming in um, and anything that I, I'm trying to think. Um, I know that this is something that a lot of companies who are in this tumultuous time have considered as a way to be able to move forward or um, they want to move on. And obviously that that's um, part of the biggest benefit and value of this. Um, and so let's see if there's any, any other questions that people have, or if you have any um, closing comments before we wrap up in, in just a couple of minutes around um, sort of almost like your last pitch around why this is a, a great um, option for, for companies in New York city. <laughs> or how people can contact you to to learn more um, and get get into this this process who who's the right person that they should go to um, and we can make sure to drop emails in, in the chat and everything um, from you know we were three organizations that um, are kind of on the ground working on this uh, the working world um, SBIDC Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation and uh, Bach Network, Business Outreach Center Network. Uh, I know from, from the Bach Network side, uh, you can reach out to myself, uh, reach out to me, Quincy Elicate. Um, and I think within the presentation, there should be contact information. I know Micaela is front and center for SBIDC, so. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think we will send to the, the people who attended the event, we will send um, our contact information. But yeah, I, I just encourage anyone who has an interest in, in learning more about this, this model to reach out to us um, and ask questions. I, I think now is the moment to think out of the box and this is really an innovative solution to to a really tough moment and and yeah we can so we can keep some businesses in new york open right great that's right so um thank you all for joining us today we're, we're nearing three o'clock so i think we can start wrapping up soon um I first of all, I just wanted to apologize to both our viewers and everyone on for all the technical difficulties today. I have to go Google which planet is in retrograde that is causing this madness because um, I think there's at least one. Uh, so thanks for everyone's patience and, and appreciate your your engagement. Um, this uh, webinar and all Made in NYC webinars um, now will live on our YouTube page um, as well as our Facebook. So if you dipped in late and you want to go back and watch, um, and we can share these links out for anyone to to watch after the fact um, to be able to you know really share this information as widely as possible. So um, thank you all for participating today. Um, continue celebrating Made in NYC Week 2020 with us uh, until Friday, October 9th. We have another panel coming up this evening around um, equitable uh, workforce uh, futures in the fashion industry in New York City. Um, and you can check out all Made in NYC Week 2020 events at www.madeinnycweek.com. So uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.